With over 16% of the votes counted, the National Electoral Council calls the election for the Freedom and Refundation Party candidate, Xiomara Castro. The president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, arrived in the Amazon region to attend to the affected communities after the strong earthquake of magnitude 7.5 registered in the country earlier on Sunday. More European countries take preventive measures to curb the Omicron variant. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your host, Gladys Quesada. Honduras National Electoral Council offer preliminary reports on the outcome of these general elections. The electoral body praised the Honduran people for the calm and peace during the voting day and also thanked the armed forces for the role in the safeguard of the process. The officials reported a turnout of 3,221,264 voters, which amounts to a 62%. After over 15% of the electoral reports she is counted, the electoral authority offered regional counties. In the initial report, said Xiomara Castro de Zelaya on the lead with 53.34% of the votes. Nasri Asfura of the National Party receives 34.01% of the votes. Therefore, despite vote counting continues, so far the Freedom and Refundation Party leads the presidential race. The presidential candidate for the Liberty and Refundation political party, Yamara Castro, asked the citizens to attend the polls and to exercise their vote in peace. First of all, what we are saying is that it should be a civic celebration in peace and that we should all be able to go out to vote. The time has come. This is the moment and the opportunity for all Hondurans to make a change in our country, a real change. And that change is represented by this woman who is speaking to you, to tell you that we should have peace and disregard to provocations. The presidential candidate for the Liberty and the Refundation Party, Zamara Castro, reiterated her commitment to install a government of national reconciliation. I have a very big commitment. Logically, I want to tell you that I am not the only one who has the answer. We are going to install a government of reconciliation because our society cannot continue to be divided as it has been these two last years. We cannot continue to live in the fear of blackmail our society is living today. We cannot continue to allow this. We need to achieve a government of national integration. As a member of the Center for the Study and Democracy, SPAD, Shen Rao offered his remarks about what is happening in Honduras and his role as an international observer during the election process. So given um, past uh, concerns about fraud and irregularities with the elections, today we have uh, dispersed our international elections observers groups across the Guzigalpa and we'll be keeping an eye out for irregularities. Irregularities not only in terms of infrastructure, like is there electricity in the polling stations, is there access to people for voting, but also irregularities in terms of any potential suspicious activity involving party officials who could be in the room, involving any sort of uh, voter intimidation. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye out for this and then we'll be reporting on these issues throughout the day. Prior to the closure of the voting centers in Honduras, our collaborator Hugo Presa dialogued with a member of the International Observers Mission. Let's listen. In Honduras, the voting centers have already closed, as scheduled at 5 in the afternoon. Let's listen to the statements of someone who has served as an electoral observer, lawyer Lauren Pineda. I am attorney Lorena Pineda and I have been appointed to be here observing that for the moment we are in calm and this has been the party, a patriotic party that we are trying to celebrate and that has been carried out so far with good attitude of both voters and people 
we are supporting. We have seen that in the last few minutes, caravans have passed by here, celebrating the supposed victory of the Free Party. That certainly could be. There is still no definite counting, but we have been in different voting centers and everyone is celebrating with their different colors. Everyone is feeling the presence of his or her winner. But we will know the truth as soon as the first day that begins, which may be between 7 to 8 p.m. The first cut will be received, and from there, we will be taking the reality of how the voting and counting are going. We have practically informed that at this hour, the voting centers have already closed. What is being developed is at the ballot box count. It is forbidden for the media and political parties to release any kind of result. Between 7 and 8 at night, the National Electoral College will give a preliminary advance of the results of these elections here in Honduras. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, denounced that the delegation of the European Union that visited the country to participate as international observers in the mega elections of last November 21st served as spies with the intention of staining the democratic process. Those who came as enemies, the delegation of spies from the European Union did not find a single element to criticize the electoral system. They searched in a report full of improvisations and poorly written. They searched and tried to stand the impeccable and democratic electoral process of Venezuela, and they could not do it. A delegation of spies that was not that of international observers. They were freely deployed around the country, spying the social, economic, and political life of the country. The Venezuelan president stressed that the opposition candidates achieved a good result in last Sunday's regional and municipal elections. It must also be said that the oppositions have gained their space. The oppositions have had a good amount of governorships and mayorships. I think that the opposition has done well. President of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, expressed his support and urged the governors and mayors elected from the opposition parties to meet with his government to adopt cooperation agreements, including all Venezuelan sectors. I also reach out my hand to all governors, mayors, men and women elected for the opposition parties or other independent parties that are neither Bolivarian, Chavistas, nor are the opposition and self-define themselves as independent. I reach out my hand to everyone for peace and to work for our country. Now we address other topics. The president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, arrived in the Amazon region to attend to the affected communities after the strong earthquake of magnitude 7.5 registered in the country earlier on Sunday. The head of state took to Twitter to express his solidarity with the affected citizens. This after meeting with the National Emergency Operations Center, Zion, to assess the monitoring and evaluate the situation in which the areas where the damages were recorded. The president also informed that he ordered the ministries and the different government agencies to conduct immediate actions to attend to the emergency. The 7.5 magnitude earthquake was registered in the Amazonas region, with aftershocks that were felt in the capital, Lima, and other other cities of the country, as well as in Ecuador and Colombia. We have addressed and urged our cabinet, the ministries and the decentralized agencies of the central government to attend not only in Condor Kanki, but these earthquakes has caused a lot of damage this morning. You can be sure 
that as of today, we will be immediately with you through the ministries. Several thousand people gathered in the central Belgrade on Sunday to protest the high levels of pollution in Serbia. The latest demonstrations follow a day after skirmishes erupted between police, environmental groups and anti-government demonstrators. Sunday's protest, named for safe breathing air, was organized by EcoWatch, an environmental group. The protesters are aiming to change government policies and problems related to the natural environment. Serbia is one of the most polluted states in Europe, but public protests have gained attention only recently, with activists accusing the authorities of allowing foreign investors to cause further damage to the environment. A third protest. Uh, for three winters we are actually um, organizing through social network to gather, how to say, to, uh, to, to gather many people that can actually uh, make a critical mass so we can push the uh, institutions in Serbia to make a change. The eruption of the Cumbre Vieja volcano on La Palma, which is part of the Canary Islands in Spain, continued as it kept sweeping lava, ash and gases over two months after it began eruption. A new lava flow has appeared at the rear flank of the volcano. The new lava stream was detected at approximately 3 a.m. local time on Sunday morning and is moving in a northeasterly direction. This latest development is concerning for authorities as it could consume more land and destroy the more residential areas if, if it keeps advancing. Although the volcano has seen decreased activity, the smoke and lava continue to spew from its gun, as scientists have said it could last up to three months. La Palma has been shaken by earthquakes every few minutes. The latest one is recorded to have a magnitude of 3.3 on the richer scale. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. More European countries take preventive measures to curb the Omicron variant. The new COVID-19 variant, first reported in South Africa, has been identified in patients in Belgium, the United Kingdom, Germany, the Czech Republic, Italy and the Netherlands. This new variant has set off alarms bells on the continent due to data from the WHO, which indicate that Omicron has a higher rate of reinfection. The suspension of flight connections with Southern African nations and the return to different levels of confinement in spite of the resistance of negationist sectors are among the measures advanced by the several governments. Meanwhile, at least 12 countries in the world have reported infection with the new Omicron variant of COVID-19, including Germany, Australia, the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, Denmark, South Africa, Botswana, the Hong Kong region of China, Israel, Italy, the United Kingdom and Belgium. According to virology specialists, this new variant has 32 mutations in the spike protein capable of affecting the virus' ability to infect cells and spread. The variant has, was detected following an exponential increase in COVID-19 infections in South Africa and reported in early September. Top European migration officials are holding an emergency meeting on Sunday in the French port of Calais to find ways to better fight migrant smuggling. The meeting comes after 27 people died trying to cross the English Channel to Britain in an overcrowded inflatable boat. UK officials will be notably absent from the gathering as the Calais City Hall, after Wednesday's sinking, the deadliest of its kind, prompted a new political crisis between Britain and France. It was decided that from December 1st, a plane operated by the EU border agency Frontex will help the countries to monitor their shores. Aid groups, meanwhile, are arguing for more humane, coordinated asylum policies instead of just more police. At makeshift camps along the French coast, clusters of people from Sudan, Iran, and Iraq huddle under the chilly rain, waiting for their chance to cross the channel. We choose not to invite the British minister here to Calais. We work in Europe with the committee, we show our solidarity, but we want to work with our British friends and allies. First of all, because geography forces us to do so, because the border with Great Britain is a day-to-day -day border. 
because there is a sea 30 kilometers from the French and European coast. We have a tunnel, we have very important economic, political and cultural changes. The British are our allies, Europe's allies and France allies, of course, and we must work with them. This meeting was not anti-English, it was pro-European. European Union and NATO leaders meet in Lithuania to assess the migrants' crisis in Belarus and Russia's military presence near Ukraine. The meeting comes ahead of a session of NATO foreign ministers to be held this week in Latvia with the presence of the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and the head of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen once again accused Belarus of organizing the migration crisis on its border as a hybrid threat against the EU with no solid evidence and expressed concern about the alleged Russian military deployment near the Ukrainian border. Moscow recently warned NATO and the United States through moving closer to Russian borders, using the military maneuvers in Estonia as an excuse. Hybrid attack. An attack organized by the Lukashenko regime. It is putting at risk the life of innocent civilians lured to the Belarus border under false promises. We stand ready to defend all allies, and we will continue to provide our partner Ukraine with political and practical support. The drums of San Juan, a traditional practice in different states of Venezuela, is one step away from being declared cultural and intangible world heritage. Our correspondent Andre Vieira traveled to the coast to learn about this tradition. The details in the following report. Between the mountains and the Caribbean Sea is Tudasana, a fishing community located three hours from Caracas, a land of peacefulness, of Afro-descendants resistance, a land of drums. One drum beats, the other one marks the rhythm, and the third one plays the bass. They play for San Juan, a 17th century tradition, a culture that goes through the years. I come from one generation, and I'm teaching the other generation how to play the drum. Practically my whole family on my mother's side plays and I like to play. Prevented from experiencing their culture by the Spanish colonizers, those who were kidnapped in Africa and forced into slavery in America used the devotion to the Catholic saint as an opportunity to practice their beliefs. Freedom and San Juan are the ones who help us to have that spirituality, that peace, the harvest and harmony. Lorenza Hueto, 65 years old, is a guardian of the drumming tradition. She dedicated part of her life to walk four kilometers to teach in rural areas, and today she is in charge of keeping the Batuque alive. The community of Tadasana and 150 other villages in Venezuela are candidates to be declared UNESCO's cultural and intangible heritage through the festivities surrounding the cult and tradition of San Juan Bautista. We recognize it as our heritage, but the fact that it is now world heritage is something that is a matter of pride and joy for all of us. After going through two stages, the final declaration by UNESCO will be announced in December. If the candidacy is approved, the drums of San Juan will be the eighth cultural and intangible heritage of Venezuela. Let's make the drums of San Juan sound when the celebration of San Juan Bautista Day is held on the 23rd and 24th. But also in December, we're going to beat the drums together with the melodies of the Christmas season. The drums are going to resound, I say, that they are going to be heard in the whole Venezuelan coast. From the Caribbean coast, they make a call to the world. I want to make an invitation to all the people of Venezuela, to all visitors who come to know our authentic tradition, our ancestral tradition and the legacy left to us by our ancestors. Culture resists, advances and multiplies. No one can silence the sound of the drums, beating for the freedom of a people. Desde el estado La Guaira, André Vieira y Jesús Romero, Telesur, Venezuela. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. 
Por Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.